Okay, it's first thing in the morning. Uh, the light, sunlight streaming in here. It's getting pretty hot in the back of the van, but I'm going to do this anyway. I, be, I was looking at this all day yesterday. I didn't, uh, on and off, of course. I didn't film yesterday because I'm wondering what I should do with this. This is pretty much as thin as I'm going to get. I might be able to get it a little thinner up here near the tip. But I'm just going to put a base on it simple base simple stem and be done I'll, I'll attack this turtle back thing i can probably get to it if i narrow it down so let's see what we can do i can probably attack that if i narrow it i beat up the flaker pretty well But the damage on the flaker is not that bad. I've had a lot worse. This is relatively soft material. Okay, so let's see. Maybe I should start with some pressure regularization. See how that works. Regularization. If, if it doesn't pressure flake easily, I'm just going to indirect percussionize it all the way around to regularize it. This is the kind of stuff that exhausts me before I can get to my other projects. Not only mentally, but sometimes I end up physically in pain because of these difficult rocks that are either they're challenges or I want to see what I can do on the side, not on video, with some of this stuff. And they'll ruin me for the rest of the week. But it's best to get these done first. I had a couple of days to rest up. I only did a minimal napping. Except for this, of course. Only minimal other napping. So it wasn't too bad. Uh, the pressure flaking on this is pretty much like I thought. It's going to be sometimes good, sometimes not good. As long as I can get a good seat and I'm using a, a longer EC stick type pressure flaker for more leverage, uh, it is flaking okay. I can, I can sharpen the edge reasonably well. So it can be useful as a cutting tool. You know, 99% of rocks can be used as a cutting tool if you fracture them. It's just the quality of the cutting is not going to be that great. A scale of 1 to 100. You can rate the quality of cutting edges on rocks of all types. Obsidian is going to be 100. Now once you start manipulating it, once... A person or a human starts manipulating the edge uh, on obsidian, for example. A human can actually make the obsidian very dull. So it's like around a 10 from a scale of 1 to 100. Just by people messing with the edge. You can actually make it a lot worse than if you messed with the edge of a piece of chert. Chert, it's kind of hard to mess up the edge unless you're actually grinding it. You can chip it and it'll be sharp because it doesn't crush very much. If it's a crushable edge like on obsidian or some of this stuff, it's going to be difficult to sharpen. And you can actually make it worse than a natural edge than if you would just take a flake off and work with a natural edge. You won't be one of those guys that says, dude, my utilized flake is dull. Can I continue to chip it? Yeah, you can continue to chip it. But if it's if it's not conducive to being rechipped easily, then it's actually going to get worse than if you just get another flake. So it might not work. So that's the exception. 
to what I was talking about the other day, the origins of flint napping are how to rechip utilized flakes. I still believe that, but that's not the only aspect of flint napping. You have to know what actually flakes well. You go out and choose. Start being selective on the types of rocks you're using. That's the, that's part of flint napping too. Your selection of the material. Now this material was selected based on availability. I think there's literally millions of tons of it easily accept, easily accessible. You would think that would be heaven. Well, it can be if you, all you need is utilized flakes. But if you need, or if you want bifaces, it can be a nightmare. So you go somewhere else looking for material for bifaces. And why do you need material for bifaces? Why bifaces? Well, bifaces make excellent knives. And we all know how useful knives are. Extremely useful. It can be a matter of life and death sometimes. The use of a knife, especially in self-defense. Gives you a much better chance of self-defense in a fight. Of course, it can be abused and it gives you a much better chance for offense as well. Abuse is the root of evil. So yeah, it can be abused, but for the most part, you're trying to preserve your life with your tools and how you use them. And bifaces are excellent tools in the form of knives. It can also be in the form of saw, saws, woodworking implements, cultivation implements, you know, harvesting or processing of plant material. Even though I switched over to carnivore diet, I'm not opposed to eating plants. I just realized that I cannot be eating plants as my staple food. It's just once in a while. You can probably give plants to children safely all the time. I found out you can, right? I mean, the, when you're young, you can process all that sugar much more easily without the insulin sens sensitivity or insulin insensitivity. After a while, you're as you get older, you're, you're, you don't uh, react to insulin in the correct way. I forget what it's called right now. Anyway. Bifaces are useful. The thinner they are, the more easily they are sharpened or resharpened. The sharp edge is what you're after. After all is said and done, it's the sharp edge that you're after. Not looks, not skill necessarily. Yes, you need skill to make these, but as long as you can get a sharp edge, it can be thick in the middle with a beautiful edge and it's perfect. I've seen many artifacts that way. As long as you have a sharp edge, that's the goal. What about penetration, dude? It's gotta have, to make an effective weapon, it's gotta penetrate a certain depth. Yes, that is true. That's why you put them on a stick. No, you put them on a stick because you only have short pieces of stone. Should be able to make long pieces of stone. Long blades. I want to see the thin long blades, dude. If you can't make a thin long blade, you're a loser. A loser. If you watch Spongebob a lot, he goes, Loser. <laughs> There's a little horn that goes, Loser. Goes, Loser.
<laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Why would they make thin, long blades? Well, you look at how they're using them. How are they using those? I think they call them dance blades for a reason. They're not even sharp. I've seen them. They got a dull spot, a chip, a dull spot, chip, a dull spot, and a chip. They're not sharpened perfectly all the way down on those big dance blades. The ones that I saw anyway. Maybe they don't need them sharp all the way down. I don't know. I really don't fight with stone weapons, so I can't tell you. All I can do is imagine. And maybe someday I'll attack a, a punching bag with a stone knife. And report back my findings. Alright. But it's not going to be... It's not going to be accurate. It's not going to be relevant, I should say. Because... It's not flesh. It's not flesh and bone. It's not flesh and bone. It's just you alone. You're the only flesh and bone there. And you're just attacking a sandbag. Irrelevant. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if we'll be able to solve that mystery. Why, does, why are some big old blades not even sharp? Relatively speaking. And then you look at their little arrowheads, little atlatl dart points. Razor sharp edges with pointy serrations, nasty needle tips. Now that's a weapon. That you don't want to get shot with. The little ones. All right. I'm trying my best to attack that turtle back. Well, I could probably do a little bit better. Yes, I can. I can do a little bit better. How? By making it more narrow, putting the stem in already. And then attack it. So that's what I will do. And I'll pretend that that was my goal all along. And I'm just showing you what it's like to try to preserve width. And how sometimes it doesn't work. Right? <laughs> no, no, no. You can't adjust the story while you're doing it. Oh no, although some people try. Yeah, just the story while they're doing it. I can't back up the camera because then it starts to fall into my stomach. The way I've got the camera set up on the tripod I'm going to have to have a tripod with weighted legs or something because if I move the camera a little bit too much, it unbalances the tripod and it falls over in whatever way, in whatever direction I'm trying to move it. Yeah. You can get a boom, one of those microphone booms. Those are cool because you can put it anywhere. You can put that microphone anywhere. You anchor the boom somewhere, skirt in, wall, move that microphone anywhere. I'll just put a camera on it. I can put the camera anywhere. Don't have to deal with this low tech stuff. And I'm using the little point, I'm concentrating the force. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. How thin do I want to go? I don't really want to go any thinner. I got like 15 minutes 
left. What am I going to do with all that time? Well, what I'm not doing is showing you or telling you or explaining the exact physics behind all these strikes. Because I don't really know. All I'm trying to do is create shear force. There it is. Creating shear force. There's a difference between getting it down to a biface or a walnut. No, no. Or almond shaped. And getting it thin. Like a tater chip. Two different strategies. It's not the same type of flint napping. The tater chip flint napping is different from the almond flint napping. Oh yes. When the tater chip is only possible with shear forces. Shear forces, the forces that no archaeologist seems to know about or they become blind to it. As soon as I register in an archaeology course, the, something happens and this wall comes down right in front of the concept called shear forces. Shear forces are sliding forces. And when you're trying to do a shear on a biface, it's the inward force that's going to drive that flake. It's not the peeling off. Although it looks like you're peeling it off because it is partially being peeled. Most of that force that's doing the thinning is going into the piece. Yes, there are peeling because you do need to separate those two components, the flake from the workpiece. There is some peeling there, but there's also some shear forcing, and there's more than just some. You're shifting your, your focus, your, you're shifting your attack. It's like when you're on a campaign, you're in a combat, your movement to contact. You, you found the enemy, you just start firing, blah, 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 and you find the enemy, then you locate, you get precise locations you get identifications and authorizations then you start sniping and bring out the snipers okay guys start picking them off it's a whole different mindset once you know what to fire at get set up okay same with this in general you just attack with the nodule just attack and make a biface once you get the biface get settled in and understand the properties of the material yada 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 you start sniping these flakes off individually be very careful and you're using a totally different attack method precise precision and with an, a totally different weapon in this case they look the same but the weapon is a direction of applied force all right yes the direction of applied force is the weapon and if there's a better way to explain it I hope to find it. I will be looking for a better way to explain that. Okay. How do I know about combat techniques? How do I know this stuff? Do I read it? Yes. Did I live it? No, never been in combat. Well then, where? That's my training. I was trained as an army officer. I've got a federal commission, which means... I hate to admit, but I'm a fed. I have a federal officer commission in the army. Army National Guard, Texas Army National Guard. I went to the Texas Army National Guard Academy as an infantryman. And then I specialized in combat engineering. So I know how to shoot people and I know how to shoot buildings. <laughs> I know how to shoot bridges and buildings and I know how to shoot everything. Where are the weak points in the structures? I could take down a building with a couple tank shots, you know, that kind of thing. Or, sir, where do we aim the mortars at this building? Yada, yada, yada. I can tell them. My one of my platoon sergeants, his favorite tactic, we were doing simulations of combat. I would show them how to do the fire support 
stuff like that. Where to attack? Precision bombing. Blah blah blah. Precision attacks. Especially on buildings. You know, you don't want to take down a whole building sometimes. For various reasons. Most of it environmental hazards. Anyway, his favorite tactic was move everyone back and then shell the whole thing. <laughs> That's it. Just completely raise it to the ground. What? And I ask, why? Why is that your favorite tactic? Why do you always do that? Less time, less material, less hassle. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Don't have to worry about it, man. That's why they have officers uh, in charge of telling everyone what the mission is. Because the mission isn't always destroy and destroy. It's not always destroy and destroy. Oh, that saves time, material. Yada yada. Anyway, what do I tell you this stuff? I'm gonna I'm distracting myself from thinking too much about this process of reduction. This is a destructive process, controlled destruction. Controlled overshot is a useless term because everything is controlled. All the destruction is controlled in flint mapping. Every bit of this destruction is controlled. So to say the controlled overshot is a thing is uh, is dumb. Everything is controlled in this to the same extent. To whatever extent it can be controlled, it is controlled. So you're not saying anything. So you're saying rock napping or uh, chip napping. It doesn't mean anything because that's what you're doing the whole time anyway. I'm gonna I'm going to criticize and harp on that because it's a pollutant. I want to clean up the environment. This controlled overshot and overshot stuff is polluting our environment. It's a napping environment. It has to be cleaned up. The ones that are propagating it are not going to clean it up. They're not going to clean it up. You can clean up your droppings, buddy. If you're not going to clean it up, someone's going to have to clean it up. Okay. So I'm getting to the point where I don't want to mess with it. I did start to file this down or grind this down here because maybe I'll take another flake. But see, this area is that skip, skip, skippy, steppy, cruddy area that may have a layering effect in it. But hopefully maybe with this more... more narrow tip. It'll concentrate the forces and really blast through there. Let's get the snipers out. Let's, let's get them 50 calories zeroed in. Start sniping these guys, no matter what they're behind. They're behind quarter inch steel. Let's get the 50 calibers out. Get, this is the 50 caliber. This is the high speed hardened tip weapon. With a good aim, you can get to the you can get to those sneaky enemies. Take them out. That sneaky fat spot. Took them out. Next. What else is next? I think we're just gonna sharpen it. I only got six minutes. And am I going to percussion or pressure sharpen? I'm going to percussion sharpen first and then pressure sharpen. Am I going to put barbs on this? I could, just to be fancy. Fancy, fancy pants. I can feel it's, it's, it's tough. It's not going to want to. 
get sharpened. But the pressure flaking was going well earlier. Uh, I can put force, I can put pressure before the strike. I just realized I haven't had my glasses on the whole time. Holy crap, that's better. Anyway, I can put pressure before I strike. Sometimes that helps. It's another thing that I, one of the tricks in the toolbox, one of the things that I was trying to explain in the previous video. What are all the stops? Pull out all the stops. What are, what are all the things? I can't remember all the things all at once. There's like six now, six or seven. One of them is pressure before the strike. That's called pressure assisted percussion. Is there percussion assisted pressure? Yes. Are you listening? Archaeologists? No, you're not watching. I know you're not watching. It's just us insomniacs, anxiety acts, maniacs, and maybe some people who just like to have fun with rocks. Right? Because it's just a rock, right? Heck, who knows you could have so much fun with a rock. They're free in a lot of cases. Like this stuff. It was probably free. Yes, yes. Excellent. You can actually make something of value that you can get for free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. I don't know what I'm going to do. No barbs. Don't have time for barbs. Already, already ate up three minutes of my six minutes. Why do I look at the clock? Because my phone shuts down. You know who I'm getting most of my ad revenue income from? Let's take a guess. I bet no one can guess this. I would never have thought most of my ad revenue is coming from Hong Kong. Hong Kong. What the heck? More than the US? More than Australia? In fact, if I add Australia and US together, it's still not as much as I'm getting from Hong Kong. Imagine that. What are some of the other places that are that I get income from? Or from my ads? Who else is watching all these ads and likes the ads? Uh, Germany. Germany likes the ads. US likes the ads. Australia likes it. I think Austria. Austria and Germany, whatever those guys are advertising over there. It's working, guys. Whatever you're advertising. And I'm getting YouTube Premium. Or YouTube Red Income. It's like maybe... 10 to 20 percent of you guys have a subscription to YouTube Red or YouTube Premium and you don't see the ads. I'm getting some of that income too. It's like 10 to 20 percent of what I get. So don't worry, if you don't see ads, I still get a little bit of money. A little bit. And uh, okay, what's the ratio? Is there, can I give you a ratio on how many views to dollars? Well, it, I saw, according to YouTube, it depends on your content and the types of ads that they can show on your content. But the, with me, I looked and I got a ratio. It seems like you can make 500 bucks for every 100,000 views if you have a channel like mine. 500 bucks for every 100,000 views. Well, we'll see. We'll see when I actually start getting the regular payouts I'm only going by the first payout so the ratio if the math works linearly you know if you don't get paid less as your viewed goes views go up if it stays constant I don't get all that many views compared to many channels right if it stays constant on a linear graph 
then you get about 500 bucks for 100,000 views if you have a channel like mine. 500 bucks for 100,000, yeah. That means if you have two really good videos a week, you can make as much as I was making as a draftsman, yeah. Am I gonna build up my channel? I'm thinking of building up my channel and putting priority on my channel content rather than uh, making and selling stuff. That's what I'm thinking. Because I can leave my channel to my children. I cannot leave my ability to make arrowheads to my children unless they actually watch the videos. All right, so I'm out of time. I might extend this video one more segment so I can really refine the edges. What do you guys think? Just tell me in the comments. Smash the like button. Subscribe. Be sure to click the... No, I'm not going to do all this stuff. <laughs> Just let me know if you want me to put an edge on it. A really refined edge. Maybe refine that stem a little bit more. Okay.